tweeting out right now. It says here how many people are watching. Right now, zero are watching. People, people will jump in, and, and as of now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save the stream afterwards, so I'll have this video, so right now we're recording, so you're on video. Um, assuming it comes out okay and the lecture's okay, I'll probably publish it to YouTube. Um, and now people are watching, so people are coming in. So there's Mr. Zoo, uh, I think that's two people watching. All right, yeah, 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 yeah. okay, fine. All right, we're gonna start. I'm at uh, the Hive Ashdod. These are the startups. And uh, so this is Meerkat, guys, and um, I'm gonna start the lecture right now, put you guys down. I will not be able to read comments, unfortunately, because the phone's like five feet away from me or something, two feet away from me, but I will read the tweets afterwards and cool, where are you? Hey, Nir, I'm in uh, the high bosh toad. All right, here we go. Okay. So I'll just give you guys a little, I think this is important in terms of, first of all, English is okay. Yeah. If I speak too fast, just like say, yo, slow down, because I drank an energy drink this morning, so I'm not kidding, I really did. Um, just want to talk a little bit about this and why this is important, uh, Meerkat. But first, let me give you a little background. Meerkat's an Israeli company. They were originally called Yevo. Um, they got an investment from Aleph, if you're familiar with Aleph VC, Eden Shochat and Michael Eisenberg. We have, by the way, 15 people, 16 people watching now. Okay, so um, they got an investment and Yevo, I hope they're not watching, they won't be insulted by this, but didn't really take off. As we know, the problems of startups is getting traction, right? You can have the greatest idea in the world, you can have all the elements in place, and it didn't take off. Um, and maybe maybe two, three months ago, they repositioned the company, they actually pulled their app from the App Store. They took, uh, they took uh, Yevo off the App Store, which cannot be easy. Uh, just, a, just a hard decision for any startup to make is to take your, pull your product. And they released something called Air, which wasn't fundamentally different than Yevo. It was the same concept, but it was little tweaks, it was a little different. And Yevo and Air too did not take off. It had a little more traction, but it wasn't then maybe a month ago, a little bit, probably a little bit more now, on a Friday afternoon, I'm sitting at home, and I get a, I see a, a new product on Product Hunt. You guys know what Product Hunt is? Okay, so Product Hunt is, if you, for those that don't know, is a, is a platform that's become one of the most influential platforms in, in Silicon Valley, in the world really, in technology, of new products that launch, and investors look at it, and you know, journalists look at it, and so there was this new product called Meerkat, and it was by the guys from Air. So I checked it out, it's an Israeli company, I usually check out any, any product that's interesting on, on product, but I checked it out and long story short, it was the same concept of live streaming, but with deep Twitter integration. So for example, I just showed you, I just hit stream, as soon as I hit stream, it tweeted it out. Now any comment, all these comments that people are commenting right now are all tweets. So now I'm, right now I can't read my comments because it's there, but afterwards I'll go back to Twitter and I'll see you know, 50, 60, 70 tweets that people wrote to me, comments, and it was integrated. So every comment is a tweet, Every time I hit stream, it's a tweet. Every time I like a stream, it's a favorite on Twitter. Very, very deep Twitter integration. Now, this pretty much instantly like caught fire. It was like unbelievable. Ryan Hoover, who's the founder of Product Hunt, you know, tweeted about it, and it just completely exploded. They raised $14 million in two weeks from the biggest VCs out there. Greylock and Ashton Kutcher and some Snoop Dogg invested in it. It's crazy. It's a crazy story. These guys live, they sit in, in Yafo, in a tiny little company. I mean, I mean really a small company. Uh, well, a few months before that, but basically came out a week after, Twitter bought their biggest competitor, Periscope. And now everyone's talking about, you know, is, is Periscope going to kill Meerkat? Is it not? But forget that. I don't, I don't, I, I personally don't think that, that discussion is of any worth, is of any value. I think that there's, there's Facebook and there's Twitter, there's Google and there's Yahoo and there's Meerkat and there's Periscope. And that's fine. So it doesn't have to be one winner. But I think on a, on more on a philosophical level, why is this important? And I think that this is very, very relevant to what we're going to talk about in a second. I think if you look kind of like historically at the concept of having an opinion on the internet, right? Of being of, of an authority or being of any um, thought leadership, right? So the way it used to be is you used to have, you know, a master's in journalism, right? And um, you'd write for the New York Times or you'd write for other big, journal other big publications, web properties, and people would not follow you. They would follow the New York Times. You happen to write for the New York Times, but they wouldn't follow you, right? In fact, I couldn't name, now I could, but at the time I couldn't name the names of the writers that I would re read on the New York Times or in the Wall Street Journal, it didn't matter to me. What mattered to me was I was reading the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Then came blogging, right? Now anybody can open up a New York Times. Anybody can open up a TechCrunch. Anybody can open up a Mashable. Go to WordPress, go to Tumblr, go to Medium, go to all these blogging, just open up a blog. And now you have your own New York Times and you can actually establish a name. And I'll talk about how I got started and that's exactly how I got started. I literally was sitting one day at work and I'm like, I love mobile. I just love technology. I don't care if anyone reads, I'm writing. And I would just get to work every day and have my cup of coffee and just start writing. That's what all started. And, uh, but, but still, 
in the era of blogging, still, what was at the center? The blog, right? The TechCrunch. Now, the guys who founded TechCrunch, Mike Arrington, he's an influential guy, he has a big name, but people still followed TechCrunch, right? So the blog was still at the center. It was a little bit more human, a little bit more you know, engaging maybe, but it was, still was at the center. Then came, after blogging, Twitter. Now all of a sudden, what's at the center? Who are you following? People. No longer web properties, right? You're following people. Okay, that was a huge shift. But, but even then, even with Twitter, and don't get me wrong, I love Twitter, right? I'm a complete addict. I've tweeted like 200,000 times. I, I'm, I'm Shabbat, my hands shake. Right? I'm, I'm, I have a problem, okay? okay? So Twitter's unbelievable. But even with Twitter, and when I say Twitter, by the way, I mean social in general. Same thing with Facebook and other platforms. There's still a barrier. What do I mean by barrier? You can read my tweet, and you could think, well, was he sarcastic? Did he mean it? Was he, you can't really understand my tone. You can't see my body language. You can't. You don't really get to know me fully, intimately. You don't. You can't really get to know a person through their tweets. It's still at the end of the day, text. Yes, it's short forms, 140 characters. It's it is personal, but it's it's still not the same as seeing someone eye to eye. The next stage, in my opinion, and why this is important, is Meerkat and Periscope and the other. There are many, by the way. It's not just there's you now and there's Livestream, another Israeli company, both Israeli companies. Actually, I think. Three out of the big four live streaming apps are Israeli, total coincidence, but um, I think this is a big trend. I think now the person's really at the center. You know, I was sitting the day after the elections in traffic on the way to Tel Aviv for two hours. I'm sitting in traffic and I'm like, you know what, I'm just listening to the radio. I'm like, I just, you know, again, one tap, stream. And I'm talking about, and I'm not a political, you know, analyst by any means. I have my opinions, everybody has their opinions. And I was talking about technology and politics and how, and the intersection and just, Something that interested me, and again, I'm, I'm by no means a you know a political expert. And 700 people sat there for two hours watching me talk about the politics. That that's some that that to me signals something. That's really interesting because these X amount of people that follow me on Twitter, while I feel like I hope they know me in some way or another, and we'll talk about that in a second, there's still a barrier. They can't really get to know me through my tweets. Yes, my blog, I try to write in a way that anybody can understand it and engage with it. And I act, and I genuinely, I do set, I send my blog posts to my mother sometimes, I promise you. And I say to her, do you understand what you're reading? And she obviously isn't a geek into technology, and if she says no, then I know I'm doing something wrong. I try to simplify, right? But even so, it's, it, you can't really get to know someone through digital text. Whereas if you're watching someone and their body language and their eyes, it, it's, a different, it's a different ball game. And so I really believe that this is the next step in kind of like the democratization, if I'm using a big word, of, of content. So I think, you know, people are talking about whether or not Periscope is killing America, I don't care, it doesn't matter. Whoever's gonna be the winner, if there'll be one winner, if there'll be two winners, there'll be 10 winners, I don't care. What I do care about is that live streaming, the ability to, for anybody to become a broadcast station is very significant, and I think it's very important. More importantly, as far as we're concerned in this room, though, is not necessarily that, but what Meerkat as a company went through. Think about what it's like to three times pivot. Once they had Yevo, and it failed. Twice air, and it failed. Again, it wasn't a complete failure. I, you know, I'm not, don't get me wrong. I hope, I'm sure some of them are watching, so I don't need to. But um, it's not an easy decision to say, I've built, and I've built, and I've built, and I'm going to just you know, pull it out of the app store and start again. That's not, a, and I'm sure all of you know that. You know, I once sat, you guys saw Envision here. Somebody said they know Envision. Envision's an awesome company, and the CEO's name is Clark. Amazing guy, one of my gurus. I love the guy. And he said something that I, I thought was really one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard anybody say. I don't know who he quoted exactly, but he said, um, investment, right, to invest in something, not money, but invest, let's say time, is the enemy of creativity, right? If you invest in an idea, and you're so invested in it, you'll do everything to make that idea work, but you won't be creative. You won't think, maybe this is the wrong idea, maybe I need to go a different way. That's a really difficult challenge for any startup, for any entrepreneur, for any, anybody really, for any venture. If you're doing something, you're very invested in it, you're investing time in it, it's very hard to say this was a bad idea, or this isn't working, or there's no market fit, let's just go somewhere else. Right? It's a hard decision to make. And so from your perspective, I think what Meerkat did, I think it's, a, it's just a, a case study to, to look at and to analyze and to, and to realize that you know, sometimes you just gotta, you gotta pivot. Right? I know that's become a buzzword and everybody likes to use the word pivot and disrupt and all these words, so I apologize for using it, but what they did was a real pivot. And it's very, very interesting to watch just from that perspective. Now I'll give you a little background on myself and then, by the way, at any point, feel free, you've heard this before, right? You were here last time. Yeah. Anybody else was here last time? Was no. We met together in Google. In the, in the Google. Oh, you weren't here. Oh, you weren't here at the last lecture when I was here last time. Oh, we met at Google. That's right, 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 right. Wait, who else did I meet at Google? I met you at Google. That's it. Got it. Okay, cool. All right. So if, I'm very casual here. So if anybody has any questions, totally just interrupt me. You can. You don't have to raise your hand. Just ask a question. We're all good. Um, so background. I'm. My name is Hillel. 
I moved to Israel from New York uh, 22 years ago. Um, and you know, I went through the normal Israeli system, high school, army, uh, college, and I studied in university, I studied political science. C completely unrelated to what I do, and I, I honestly I just studied it because it was interesting to me, not because I ever thought for a second that I'm gonna be a politician, because that never crossed my mind. Um, and after I finished that, like we all know, I had no idea what I wanted to do with myself, completely lost. Someone said to me, why don't you become a technical writer? You guys know what a technical writer is? Yes? Not a technology writer, a technical writer. No. No, I didn't either. It's the guys who writes the, write the manuals that no one reads. You know, when you buy something, you get a, a, a pamphlet that no one reads? Yeah, I wrote that, right? So um, I took. So someone said, go be a technical writer. I was like, all right, I don't know what that is, but sure, why not? So I took a course in technical writing, and it was a beginner's course. And at the course, the woman who was giving the course said, listen, guys, this is a beginner's course. Don't go send your resume for 10 years you know, experience, you know, jobs with 10, that need 10 years experience after this. This is beginners. Sure enough, the day I finished the course, I see that Converse, if you guys are familiar, Converse was the, guy, the company that invented voicemail, and they were once big, now they're already not so, not so big, but um, they were looking for sure enough for a 10-year experience position. And I'm like, all right, I'll send you my resume, right? So I sent in my resume, until today, by the way, I have no clue why they even called me in the first place, but they called me in for a test. The test was putting me in front of a screen um, on which an engineer, what they called an SME, a subject matter expert, was talking in a third Hebrew, a third English, a third Russian. Basically, the, the, the goal was to completely intimidate me, and I was not supposed to understand anything. He was talking about mobile technology, and I was to answer questions afterwards. But again, because I was very passionate about this, it was relatively you know, easy to understand. So I answered questions, and apparently I did well. And they called me back for a second interview, and a third interview, and a fourth interview, and a fifth interview, and I kid you not. And the fifth inter interview was, dude, you are like super ADHD. Can you really sit and write documents all day long? And besides, we have no capacity to train you. We're throwing you in the deep end, and you need to learn how to swim. Can you really do that? Now, between me and you, I had absolutely no idea, but I was like, yeah, for sure, easy, no, no problem. So I, I got that job, and I, I remember the first day at Commerce, I walk in, it's this tremendous company, I'm like, holy, this, what the hell have I gotten into? I'm crazy, and it was very scary. But after a little bit, I learned how to swim, I learned how to write documents, and I was there for two and a half years. Those two and a half years, I learned two very important lessons. Number one is technical writing is the most boring thing on the planet. Hands down, there's no, no competition. And number two thing that I learned, which is, which is very relevant to everyone here, is that, and genuinely, but not, not because you know I think it's. And by the way, this was eight years ago, so blogging wasn't mainstream like it is today. And I wasn't looking, you know, it's you know profitable. I could make money from it. I could build a brand. None of that. None of those buzzwords existed then. I said I really love technology. I'm just going to start writing. And again, didn't do any SEO. And if I'm using terms that anybody doesn't know, just stop me. I didn't do any of that garbage. I didn't, sorry, I mean the garbage. Garbage. SEO is a very good industry. <laughs> no, but I didn't do any of the tricks to get traffic. I just started writing. But here's the thing. As a technical writer, you need to take something very complex and simplify it, right? Because I'm, I'm selling this you know, SMS system to like telephone where Dudu has to like maintain it and he has to know what to do. He has to read my, understand what, so that's what a blogger needs to do. And like I said, I send my blog post to my mom sometimes and I ask her if she understands it. If anybody's read any of my writing, whether it's on Facebook, Twitter, generally speaking, no matter how ungeeky you are, you understand what I'm talking about, I hope. Yes? I hope, okay, good. So anyway, long story short, I started writing. Every day I would just write something. I didn't care who was reading it. I didn't, I didn't even look at my analytics. Slowly but surely started building up an audience because it was uh, consistent, and we'll talk about consistency in a second. It's very important. Started writing as often as I can. You know, not 50 posts a day, generally a post a day. Actually, the other day, a friend of mine, uh, who's the CEO of an SEO company, sent me an email that I sent to him in 2007, basically um, asking him to read my blog and how I, you know, basically letting all my friends know about my blog. I was somewhat of a spammer back then. Uh, I was just getting started, and there was no such thing as a spammer in 2007. Now it's already, everyone's doing it, but anyway, so that's when I started. Uh, then Converse had major layoffs, uh, and I was fortunate enough to be part of them. Um, and I had no idea what's next. Someone said to me, and again, another CEO of an interesting startup, uh, a friend of mine named Itamar, uh, says to me, you gotta join Twitter. I said, another place to update my status? What do I need that for? And he literally physically went and opened up my Twitter for me. He said, you need to try this platform. And he opened up my Twitter, and I, and I got on Twitter, and the, the rest is history. Like, I was an addict from day one. And I don't know if you guys, are you guys active on Twitter? Anybody here active on Twitter? I mean, Twitter is a phenomenal platform, and I'm going to tell you some, some things that have happened to me over the years that would blow, would blow your mind, honestly. Um, but then I started tweeting, and that became my next addiction. And I say the addiction in a good way, not in a bad way. I mean, blogging and Twitter, I was very, very consistent at it for years. Never used any software to, like, increase followers. I didn't buy any followers. I didn't... Again, didn't do any really real SEO for my blog, I just consistency. Um, and then, I think uh, two or three months later, I got recruited by a finance company. Now here's the thing, I'm allergic to numbers, as I was telling you, I hate numbers, 
right? I'm not, a, I'm not a finance guy, I'm the opposite. So he said to me, come do marketing for us, we're a finance company. I said, what do you want, crack? I knew nothing about finance. And he said to me, it doesn't matter. You'll learn finance, but, but you, you can write and, and marketing. We want, we want you for that. I said, all right, let's do it. So I get to, I get to this job. The first day of my, of my job, I sit at a desk, and I, I kid you not, for 30 days, I sat there just reading, right? Just reading about the industry. I didn't write a word, I didn't do anything else but learn. Day 31, and I start writing blog posts about the industry. About, about uh, simple stuff, because I'm no, by no means any expert. But starting, you know, five reasons to trade, five very, very simple stuff. Within two to three months, I'm getting emails by the tens every day asking me what currency to trade. And then it hit, as they say in Hebrew, as Simon fell, right? It hit me. On the internet, through content, but good content, not crap. Good content, you can brand yourself as an expert of anything. Okay, now here's what, here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying to, to scam and to lie. What I'm saying is, if you, if, you wanna, if you do something, whatever it is you guys do, right? B2B, B2C, whatever it is, you're selling Barbie dolls. Own Barbie dolls, right? You need to come into your office, this office, every day, and we'll, we'll obviously talk a lot about this. You know, this is really the, the foundation of everything. And generate content. Okay, what does that mean? Content it means your company can have a blog. You know, what's your website? Dot com. So it should have blog dot dot com, right? You should have a blog under your domain, subdomain, and you should generate content as often as possible. Let me ask you a question. Do you guys read tech blogs? What, what tech blog do you read? Give me an example. Tech Crunch. What is? Do you think tech? If any TechCrunch writers are reading or watching this, I apologize. Mm -hmm. What does TechCrunch do that I don't do? Why does TechCrunch have tens of millions of readers a month and I have hundreds of thousands? Uh, big brand. Big brand, that's why? They started I don't, off... I don't, I don't know your brand, if, if, I, if I knew. You think it's just the brand? Uh, probably if, if you had a good content and you had uh, some links or uh, referrals or other groups. Any other explanations why they, big blogs? They have more resources, <coughs> they have more resources to, uh, to uh, establish conventions, etc. For, for I, think that's the, I think this, you guys are, I think this is the, as they say, the, uh, you're getting the horse in front of the wagon with the wagon. Like that, this is the result of, of them having a lot of traffic. They, had, they built a convention, they built all this stuff because they already had a brand. The brand came, but the brand came as a result of something. What, what brought them all that traffic? What brought them all that attention? I'll tell you the answer. Content, content but not just content, volume. Right, I went into Mashable headquarters a few months ago, <laughs> last year. You walk in, you, you can't even see the end of the writers. Everyone's writing, nonstop. Right, they're generating 80, 100, 200, however many articles a day, I'm writing one. This is the way the web works, period. And you know, there's this whole SEO industry out there trying to get more links, and you buy links and all this. Dude, just write good content. This is what Google does. Let me tell you a story. Years ago, when Instagram came out, there were like tens of apps that did the exact same thing before Instagram. Many, many, many apps. Hipstamatic and Pick Please and Camera Plus and all these, they did the exact same thing. But someone sent me, uh, let me just see how many people are watching here. Cool. Somebody, so, somebody sent me Instagram and they said, check out this app. It's like another photo sharing app. I was like, all right, I'll try it. I tried it. I don't know if you guys use Instagram, but it worked way better than any other photo sharing app out there. And I didn't know what it was exactly that, that it did differently, but now, you know, now I do know after all these years, but at the time it was just better execution. And I'm like, this is, this is unique. So I wrote a blog post at the time, this is many, five years ago probably, saying, I think the title was, uh, five things Instagram got right that others before it couldn't. And the important thing to know here is that if I had gone to an SEO expert that day, and I would have said, should I write this article? What he would have done is he would have searched how, how much search volume there is. How many people search for the word Instagram? And he would have found that zero. And he would have said to me, don't waste your time, because you're not gonna get any traffic from it. But I did, I wrote this article because it was good content. And literally the next day I was on top of Google for the word Instagram, but that did nothing for me because no one was searching. But fine, I'm there. Fast forward a year, all of a sudden Instagram is Instagram. And I'm all the way up there and I'm getting traffic, 10, 20, 30,000 hits a day. Fast forward four years and Zuckerberg buys in for a billion dollars, I got over 100,000 hits on a post four years old. Now here's the thing, forget the traffic guys. If I had gone to an expert on data, a data expert, call him SEO, call whatever you want, he would have said to me, don't write this post, it's not worth it. But I wrote good content at the time did I know that this was gonna happen? Obviously not. But the point is, the way the web works is that good content wins. That's, 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 the end, that's the end game, right? So someone once told me something actually really brilliant about the way the web works, and this is super important to all you guys. You know, Everybody needs SC, everybody needs search. He said to me the following, and this is, if you take away one thing from this, this talk, and this is probably it, so listen closely, this is very important. He says like this, the web, and your website is like the restaurant industry, okay? You open up a restaurant, 
What's the first thing you need to do? Put a sign outside, right? Somebody walks by, they need to know is this a hamburger joint or a pizza joint? Otherwise, they're not coming in. They don't even know what they're gonna get. They're not coming in. So that's your, first of all, your, your title on your, on your webpage. What are you, right? I go to search and I find your website. I don't even, it, there's no description. I have no idea what, you're, what you do. I'm not clicking, I'm not coming in, okay? What's the most important thing when you go into a restaurant? It's the most important thing in a restaurant, people. Wake up. Food, food right? Content. If the food in your restaurant isn't good, I can bring anybody to your restaurant, they're not coming back, right? If the content on your website's not good, you can buy all the traffic you want, you can bring it, they ain't coming back, because there's nothing there for them. Food is key, content is key. You need to bring people there and keep them there because of the content. What's the second most important thing in a restaurant? Service. Service, right? It needs to move, right? If I, or, if, I call, if I order something and the waitress comes three hours later, I ain't coming back. That's, that's the performance, the optimization of your site. If your site doesn't move, if it's not mobile optimized, if it doesn't appear right, if I click on a link and 30 seconds later it opens, you're dead. Not only will people not come back, Google will kill you. Right now, Google just added its mobile optimized thing on their search. I don't know if you guys saw this. Mobile search right now, it says, is the, is the site mobile optimized or not? If I see something that's not mobile optimized, I ain't clicking, right? That's the second most important thing. But let's talk scale, right? Because that's what everyone interest, everyone's interested in scale. So fine, I can put a, you know, a sign outside, I can bring in a few people, but that's not gonna bring in millions of people. How do I bring millions of people to my restaurant? Simple, food journals need to write about you. The more food journals that write about you, the more people hear about you, right? But let's, let's not kid ourselves. There's a big difference if I have a food journal that has 50 readers and I write about you, and if the New York Times food journal writes about you. There's a big difference, right? And that's called incoming links. If you have an incoming link from the New York Times, Google knows you are, you are somebody serious. If I link to you, it's worth something, but it's not the same, right? Now, how is that determined? Authoritative sites, it changes all the time. Google's algorithm changes. It used to be page rank, that's no longer relevant. And I'm sure there's some SEOs here who are saying, this guy's nuts, he's wrong, but I'm sure there, there things change all the time. But the point is, the concept of the web is to get as many people talking about you as possible. And when I say talking about you, that means linking to you, right? How do people link to you? No one's linking to your homepage. Maybe somebody who's reviewing cool products, but that's, gonna, that's not gonna be on scale. How do you get people talking about you? By writing good content. Right? When I went to the company where I previously worked, a company called Interactive, they're in Petr Tikva. They work in mobile advertising. I sat down with the CEO the first day of my job. He says to me, we have to reach 10,000 developers in 2011. How are you gonna do that, right? So he's a traditional kind of guy, you know, businessman. He said, he thought I was gonna say, you know, SEO, PPC, some ads, some this and that. I said, I'm gonna start a blog. He thought I was nuts. He said, what do you mean a blog? I said, I'm gonna start a blog for this company right now, blog.interactive.com. He's like, what does that have to do? That's wonderful. What does that have to do with anything? I said, not only am I gonna start a blog, but on this blog, I'm not gonna talk about the company at all. He was ready to kick me out of his office on the first day. He's like, he, he literally had no idea what I was talking about. I said to him, listen, this isn't the first time I'm doing this. He's alone, go with me. Let's, let's go with the flow, right? Let's, let's make it happen. I started writing every day. I literally would come into the office every day and write something, right? It doesn't, sometimes it's a thousand word articles analyzing the market. Sometimes it's a hundred, not a hundred, 300 word articles. Sometimes it's a cool video with a hundred word, you know, something. Good content came every day out of interactive, every single day. Fast forward four months, and this company, of a, a blog of a company in Petr Tikva, a small little company, by the way, that's competing with the biggest beasts out there, right? AdMob, AdMelt, Google owns them both. Millennial Media at a billion dollar IPO. These guys are, they're, they're our competitors. We're this little company, right? All of a sudden, four months later, this blog is quoted on CNN Money as what? An authority in mobile advertising. Then he got it. Because how else, in a million years, would this company in Petr Tikva be quoted on CNN Money as an authority in mobile advertising, right? It's nuts. But through content, every day, good content. Again, I'm not saying to write crap. You have to write good content. And it has to be unique content, by the way. It's another thing about the industry with restaurants. If you're in a restaurant, imagine this, and you're eating, you're eating a portion of food, but you're eating some you know, special thing that they have, and it's delicious, it's great, it's called whatever, X. Then you leave that restaurant, you go down the block, and there's another restaurant there that's been there 50 years, that's been there for 50 years. And you go in there and it's the exact same portion, same name, same taste, same everything. What's your assumption? The first guy's copied from them, right? That's what's called duplicate content. Because if I wanna write good content, I'll just copy and paste from the New York Times and post, paste it on my, on my site all day long. No, no go, right? You can't just copy content. And, it, and I got news for you. If, you if, if the New York Times copies from you, Google will assume you copied from them. Now, obviously the New York Times doesn't plagiarize, but the point is you need to make sure your content is unique. So it's, it's high quality and it's unique. It has to be unique to you. There are ways around you can take a, a paragraph and link back. We're not gonna get into that, but the point is good, unique, consistent content. Now, you know, at the end of the day, years later when I've been writing this blog at Interactive every day, the blog, which didn't sell. Now obviously, by the way, I'm not naive. I'm not saying, you know, just write about, you know, ballet. No, you write about your industry. 
and you have an option on top. Sign up now, use our SDK. There are ways to convert if I want to, but don't sell. Provide valuable content. Three, you know, years later, this blog that wasn't selling ended up selling. People were coming in there by a lot, and there were months that we had hundreds of thousands of readers, right? And it was, it became, you know, there's a, I don't know if you guys ever heard of Tech Meme. You know Tech Meme? Tech Meme was like the aggregator of top tech news. So when there's a breaking story, you know, it shows that the, the, the sources for that story. Pretty consistently, this, again, a blog of a company, Petak Tech was quoted on Tech Meme alongside TechCrunch and the next web, and, and, we're just, and we're not a content, but these guys, their product is content. Right? We have a product, but yet we were quoted there as an authority, an authority in mobile advertising. That's the goal of everything. Right? That's the goal of all you guys. Whatever it is you're doing, and again, I don't care if you're selling Barbie dolls. Own it. Right? Own it. Become the Google of your little niche. Okay? Now, I just want to tell you um, a story that happened several months later. I'm at Interactive one morning, having my morning coffee, and I get a tweet to the company account in caps lock. What does caps lock mean on the internet? The guy's yelling, right? pissed off. Has anybody ever tried your SDK? Publicly, he asks me on Twitter, has anybody ever tried your SDK? So I wrote back from the company account. I said, of course, what seems to be the problem? And he says to me, I've been trying to implement, to integrate your SDK for three months and it's not working. He's really angry. I said to him, okay, publicly. I said, oh, no problem. Here's my email. Send me some details, right? Five minutes later, I have an email in my inbox explaining what happened. So I call over, you know, my R&D and I literally, down, I said, come over here and fix it. He says, you know, this is what he needs to do. Tell him to do this. So I wrote him back. He writes me back. I write him back. Five minutes later, this guy opens Twitter to his followers and he writes, Dear Interactive, you are my hero. Now let's step back a little bit and think about what just happened, right? Traditional marketing, think about like a billboard, right? So you could be driving on the road, and let's say for, for, for one second that we're not looking at our phones, which we all are anyway, but let's say for one second we're looking at billboards. Who looks at billboards? Let's say we are. And let's say, let's say we convert. Meaning I see a billboard for Sony and I buy a Sony product, which again, we know doesn't happen. But let's say, if tomorrow Toshiba calls me and say to me, you bought that for $99, I'll give it to you for 98. I'm out of there, right? I just bought a Sony product because I saw a billboard. I don't have any loyalty to Sony. I don't give a crap, right? Whereas this guy didn't tweet, you know, Dear Interactive, thank you for your support. Five minutes ago, he was pissed off at us. In five minutes, through answering his email, I didn't do anything. I didn't spend any money. I didn't do anything. Five minutes of listening, answering his email, and dealing with the problem, he then responds, Dear Interactive, you are my hero. So he went from a hater, not to a user. He didn't just convert. He became my ambassador. Now he's doing my work. That is something that traditional marketing doesn't know how to cope with, right? Again, traditional marketing, the best case scenario is conversion. I click and I buy, great. Loyalty, sentiment, emotion, traditional marketers don't know how to deal with that. There's no way to achieve that. Let me tell you a story. Anybody hear of the name Gary Vaynerchuk? Besides you guys, because I definitely told you about it. Did I tell you about it? Anybody hear the name Gary Vaynerchuk? Nobody? You should all be ashamed of yourselves. Um, okay, so Gary Vaynerchuk, and I'm curious to see if you watch. No, he's not. Oh, Gary Vaynerchuk's a big Meerkat guy. He, I think he invested in Meerkat, actually. So Gary Vaynerchuk is a, is a, uh, he's Jewish. Uh, he came to the U.S. from Russia at a very young age. You heard of him, right? Okay, so he, uh, he was, I spoke about him last time. Anyway, so he, um, he, if you think I'm energetic, you ain't seen nothing yet. You gotta open his YouTube channel and just watch him, you'll be mesmerized. So, um, so he came to the US and his dad opened up a wine store in Edison, New Jersey called Wine Library, okay? And his dad, you know, he's a Russian guy, he didn't have connections, he didn't necessarily have the best English, he didn't have the American culture, and so Gary says, like, I was watching my dad going to work every day, you know, working his ass off, pardon my French, and making minimum wage, and basically, he's like, there has to be a better way, right? So Gary took this thing called Wine Library and he put it on YouTube. He called it Wine Library TV. And he would sit at a table all day and sell you wine. If you've heard of it, if you're not, you haven't heard of it, you should watch it. Even if you don't like wine, you should watch it because he's an amazing salesman. Bottom line is he brought this, he brought this wine store with, from basically no revenue, this local wine store, to 50 to $80 million revenue within a few years, depending who you ask. I think it was 50, but I'm not sure. So I heard 80, I heard 50. Either way, it exploded. So he was really the first kind of marketer to monetize this thing called social media. Because everybody's talking about social media, right? But it's all buzzwords and fluff and brand awareness and blah, blah, blah. And he, was, he brought dollars and cents. So he tells the story that after he did that, all the big brands wanted a piece of the action. You know, So he was at Pepsi one day, and he, there was a new VP of Pepsi that day. And she says to him the famous question that everyone wants to know, what's the ROI of social media, right? She says, I'm the VP of Pepsi. I have X amount of millions of dollars for marketing. I could buy billboards. 
I can buy an ad in the New York Times, or I can pay you to BS on Twitter all day long. What's the ROI? What's the return on investment? So he's taking out his graphs, showing her brand awareness and brand loyalty, and she's like, dude, what are you talking about? I need to sell more Pepsi. Don't give me this mumbo jumbo, right? So he's trying to talk to her in his language. She's talking a different language. They're not communicating at all. And he says, I need like 30 seconds to get through to her. So he says, I went for the shock factor. So remember, guys, just remember, remember the scenario, right? Top level executives of Pepsi and this little punk named Gary Vaynerchuk. And he looks her in the eye, the VP of Pepsi, and he says to her, what's the ROI of social media? What's the ROI of your mother? So there's a little awkward silence in the room for a second there. And he says, let me explain what I mean. He says, when you're growing up and your mother tells you you're beautiful, right? Or when you scrape your knee in school and your mom says, you'll be okay. Or when you lose a baseball game, right? And your mom says, you'll win next time. He says, can you quantify the value of those statements? He says, can you stand at a board with a clicker and say, my mom told me I was beautiful when I was six. So when I was 18, I founded a company that I then, I can't do that, obviously, right? But anybody with a half a brain and basic understanding of human psychology understands, as he says, that the ROI of my mother is everything. You better believe that the reason I founded a company when I was 18 is my mom told me I was beautiful when I was six, right? It's everything. But to quantify it in, you know, the, the, the ROI of my mom is that to take what you're building with an audience on social, forget Twitter, forget, forget the tools, that's, that's not important. But the ability to listen to your audience and communicate with your and have a face, right? And have a personality and have something that they can relate to and interact with, to quantify that in clicks, you can do it, right? There are companies, there's Radiant 6, there's Tracks, there's many companies to quantify it. But you're taking something this big and you're putting it into something this small. He says it's much bigger than that. So I think he got, the, I think he got Pepsi as a client. But, uh, Later on, someone came into his store and bought uh, thousands of dollars of wine, and he did something brilliant. He could have like, sent the guy a thank you note or whatever. What did he do? He followed the guy on Twitter, okay? For a few weeks, he followed this guy who bought $10,000 worth of wine, he followed him on Twitter. And it turns out that this guy is a huge fan of some football player. I'm not a football guy, so I can't tell you his name, but some famous quarterback, I believe he was. Big football player, he doesn't stop talking about this football player. He loves this football player. So Gary Vaynerchuk goes to, I think, eBay, he buys the shirt signed by that quarterback, his own jersey, signed by him, and he sends it to the guy's house. The guy writes back saying, you, I will never buy wine from another company till the day I die. <laughs> well, it cost him probably 80 bucks, you know? It was, it was a th but that right there, you cannot achieve that with a billboard. You just can't, right? And what does Gary say? I, 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 I talk about him because I, I think he, he gets a lot of, you know, my world, I mean, his world really, but you have to watch this guy. I mean, he says, are you kidding me? These Fortune 500 companies are paying for billboards? Do you understand how we, how we analyze and we quantify the effectiveness of billboards? There's a man standing there with a clicker, counting how many cars drove by. That's how we quantify. Are you kidding me right now? We're in 2015. And he says, who the hell's looking at billboards? We're all looking at our phones, right? So the point is, what you're doing when you're listening, when you're listening on Twitter, you're building something that's much greater than a, than a sale, <clears throat> than a conversion. Yes, it sells. Of course it sells. But it's loyalty. It's long-lasting loyalty, right? So I'll tell you a story that happened to me. And by the way, again, questions totally stop me at any point. Um, and we'll try to we'll try to zone in a little bit, kind of like on what you guys are doing and how you can actually implement this, because you know it's, I know it's very out there right now, but it, it's really a lot easier than it sounds. I went to uh, San Francisco with my wife a few years ago, and we stopped off in uh, Italy, I believe, in an airport. I walked into the electronics store, and I tried on Bose headphones. You know the Bose Q15 noise canceling headphones. Anybody here ever tried those things? Nobody's tried the boats. You guys have not lived. Amazing, right? I mean, you put this thing on, you're in another world. Like, you don't hear a thing. I, I was drooling. I said to my wife, I gotta get them. She looked at the price tag. She says, they're $350, and you don't even listen to music. What are you doing? I said, I'm buying these headphones. She said, no, you're not. I was like, I'm not gonna argue. Fine, I didn't buy them. I got on the plane, and I'm sitting next to this guy. We're about to take off. And what does he do? He puts on his Bose headphones. And I'm like, it's a sign. I gotta get the headphones. She's like, you're not getting the headphones. Forget it. Choose your battles. So I landed, and the first thing I did, of course, was I tweeted and I said, I just tried the Bose, I think it's QC15 or Q15 noise canceling headphones. Wow. That was it. A few hours, 24 hours later, within, within a day or two, I don't remember the exact hours, I don't want to be inaccurate, um, I get a knock on my door from DHL. Here's a present from Bose. Now, before you answer, I know what you guys are thinking, right? So, oh, he's a lot of followers on Twitter, so it was a PR move. I'm not disagreeing with that, but here's what's interesting. Bose was not following me on Twitter. They weren't. But when I men mentioned the word Bose, they heard. Why? Because they have a search for their brand. And anybody that mentions their brand, good or bad, they hear. Now in my case, they said he has X amount of followers, 
it's worth it for us to send him a pair. And he'll probably push us. They didn't ask me to push it. They didn't say, you have to review them. They didn't do anything like that. But they heard me, and they decided to act. By the way, had I said, I freaking hated those things, they probably would have responded as well. But they heard. Fast forward a few years, I buy a house. And I needed, first thing, one of the first things I needed was a shed, machsan, for outside. So I tweeted, I need a shed. Now, you know, you might be thinking, Bose, Bose is like a big global brand. Yeah, they can afford that. Keter Plastic, familiar? Israeli? I mean, now they're not Israeli, they're already a global company, but they were originally Israeli. They sent me a 5,000 shekel shed that's pretty much the size of an apartment. And again, they didn't ask me for anything. Of course, in both cases, I did review it and I did try to get them publicity, but the point is, again, they weren't following me. And I don't know how they even got to me. Probably they were searching for the word shed, I don't know. But they got to me, they heard me. So what I'm saying is, somebody once said, you have two ears and one mouth. Use them in that ratio, right? People think of Twitter and other platforms, and I'm using Twitter as an example, but it's true about other platforms as well. People think of Twitter as a sales platform. That, is, that could not be farther from the truth. In fact, trying to sell on Twitter aggressively, download my app, use my thing, we're the greatest, check us out, is probably the worst thing you can do to your brand, right? You'll be labeled pretty instantly by people and by Twitter, by the way, in some cases, as a spammer. It might actually shut you down if you do that. And it happens to me on a daily basis, right? You know, I, someone writes to me, at Hills Full, that's my Twitter, down, download my app. What do I do first? I check out their profile, look at their tweets, and what do they do? They write at people over and over, hundreds of times, download my app, download my app. It's pure spam. That A, drives nothing. No one's downloading an app from a tweet like that. But more importantly, you just ruined your brand, right? Now, I just want to, I want to, I want to emphasize something that when I said in the beginning about the importance of, of relationships and of personal knowing someone, right? When, I, when my daughter was born, she's now six the other day, I came back from the hospital with my wife and I had a basket like this high off the ground. I'm not kidding, full of clothing. I'm like, what the hell? I open it up from your Twitter followers. People I have never met and I probably will never meet. But what they said to themselves, I'm assuming, is this guy for the last X amount of years is writing content and is providing me with value. And he never asked for anything. He just had a baby, we're gonna get him a present. It was, it was one of the most beautiful things that I've ever experienced. Another thing that happened to me on Twitter, and again, just gonna keep repeating it, it's all platforms. We can talk about, we're gonna talk about other platforms soon, but um, a few years back, I'm sitting in my house, I live in Beit Shemesh, right? End of the world. I'm sitting in my house and I get a push notification saying, Alyssa Milano has followed you on Twitter. You guys know what Alyssa Milano is? No? How old are you guys? In your 30s? <laughs> yeah. Alyssa Milano, remember? Who's the boss? Yeah, 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 boss? yeah, yeah exactly. so She's like a huge geek now. She's, she's, pretty, she's pretty big in Hollywood right now. She's, she's a big, she's a tremendous amount of followers on Twitter and she's very influential. And I said to myself, what the heck? I literally, I, I clicked on like, this is probably like a fake account or something. And sure enough, two and a half million followers. And I'm like, did something that I never do. I, know, I don't believe in doing this, but I DM'd her, I direct messaged her, which you can only do if someone follows you. And I said, sorry for asking this, but WTF, how the hell did you get to me, right? I'm this little religious guy sitting in Big Chemish, and you're Alyssa Milano, and you followed me. How did that happen? Like, I was genuinely curious from like a, from a marketing standpoint, how did that happen? She says to me, it's very simple. Every single day in my Twitter feed, retweet Hills Full, retweet Hills Full. Your blog posts keep appearing in my feed. And I'm like, after X amount of months that I keep seeing your blog posts, who is this Hills Full guy? Right? So she clicks on my, she said this to me, I clicked on your bio, and I'm like, oh, he has a cute picture, he's smiling, he looks like a friendly guy. Oh, he's a nice, his bio, you know, it's three line description, it's funny, a little humor, and it's cute. I follow the guy. Fast forward a year, and I get a press release from a company called Twitterland. Three brothers in Haifa, Israeli guys, I didn't even know they were Israeli, and they sent me a press release, which I get hundreds of a day, and they're all the same crap. They're all, dear blogger, you know, totally not personalized, and this was a personalized email. Dear Hillel, we follow you on Twitter, we love what you do. We enjoyed this post, we enjoyed that post. Very personal. We would love it if you check out our platform. Not we would love it if you write about us, not tweet about it. We'd love it if you check out our platform. I said to myself, I don't even care what these guys do, I'm gonna help them. Because they spend time, right? So I looked at what they do and sure enough, I actually did like what they did. So I wrote a blog post calling, uh, with the title, uh, the one tool you need to know to decide who to follow back on Twitter. And I tweeted it. Alyssa Milano retweeted it, she followed me. Some Arab sheik in Saudi Arabia with 50 million followers retweeted her. Their servers melted, melted. They launched their entire company from one tweet and when they spoke at South by Southwest years later and they talked about their launch strategy, they had a big picture of my face and under me Alyssa Milano and under, me, under her a, an Arab sheik. One tweet, one tweet. And you guys remember when there was a, a plane that landed on the Hudson? Remember that the famous? The guy, by the way, who now I'm friends with through Twitter uh, was part of the like, uh, rescue team. 
They called him to, you know, to rescue the, there's nobody, they were standing there, right? But he took out his iPhone, he took a picture. He tweeted that picture. The, the numbers that I was, was told, and again, I will look this up just to make sure that I'm not in any way exaggerating, but I, my understanding is that picture of the, the famous picture that you've all seen with the, yeah. got 90 million views before CNN reported there was a plane crash. Do you understand? 90 million people on Twitter knew about this before CNN or any of the traditional media outlets knew, even knew that it happened. Do you understand what, I mean, and you know what? Maybe that, you could call that like a monumental, okay, that, I get it. During the last, during the Gaza war, right? True story, and I'm, I'm happy to send you this tweet, it's unbelievable. I'm driving on Ayalon, right? Ayalon is a highway in Israel, by the way. I'm driving, and there's a, a zakat, there's a siren. Now, you know, we're, we were all pretty used to it, especially here in Ashdod. I know I didn't come here for a lot of while, it's the middle of the war, like Gaza, whatever, but it was, uh, you know, we were all used to it. We heard sirens, it was, it was like totally second nature to us, but I was driving on Ayalon, all of a sudden, all the cars pulled to the side, and there's this one woman crouching down like this, and she was trembling. Clearly, this was her first siren. She was trembling, right? Every, it was a very surreal kind of like view. All the cars on the main highway of Israel were pulled over to the side. This woman was sitting on the side of that. It was, it was a pretty like, so of course, what did I do? I took out my phone and took a picture. What else would I do, right? So I took a picture of her, and I, and I, I, just, I, just, I just tweeted it. I just tweeted it, right? I think last time I checked, it got 1,300 retweets. That picture was picked up by BuzzFeed, by Mashable, by Times of Israel, by, I mean, rough estimate, because there's really no way to know exactly how many, how many views a picture got, but if I'm just rounding up, because I know how much traffic these sites get, it got somewhere around 50 million views. 50 million, I mean, say I have a lot of followers, I have less than 30,000 followers. 30,000, 50 million, those don't add up. So it, I want everyone to understand that that is one form of content. That was a picture, right? it was a visual content, but that's content. At the end of the day, that's content. And so this person who, sh who shared that picture of, of the Hudson, he didn't have a lot of followers. He didn't. He was a completely anonymous guy. But good content on Twitter, on Facebook, on blog, anywhere, on YouTube, can go very, 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 very far. You know, there's a story, and I highly recommend you guys all YouTube this afterwards. This is an amazing story. There was a Canadian singer, also not a famous singer by any means, who was, tra who was uh, traveling United. And um, he, he checked in his guitar. It's a very expensive guitar. And uh, as he sat down on the plane, he looks out the window and he sees that the, uh, excuse me, the employees of United are throwing his guitar. Like one throws it to the other and it falls on the floor, right? So he's like, all right, my guitar is trashed basically. There's no way it's, you know, it's broken. So when he landed, he walked over to the United employee. He said to her, listen, I'm about to get my guitar and I'm telling you right now, it will be broken and I expect compensation. She basically said to him, talk to the hand, like, whatever, we're not, we're not paying you, right? He said, listen, you broke my guitar and I want compensation. He fought them for a year, the bureaucracy, and they basically said no. And he said to them, I'm gonna create a, a series of YouTube videos, and I'm gonna bring you down. They're like, we're united. What are you gonna do to us? And he created a series called United Breaks Guitars. And it's hilarious, hilarious. Hundreds of millions of views, and there's debates whether this is true or, I mean, their stock plummeted. Now, some people say there's no way that a YouTube video could have brought down the United, whatever, it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, United came back and said, please, we are begging you, do not make the second video. Please, because any, anybody who's anybody on the web, all they were talking about was United Breaks Guitars. Literally, when I hear, till today, by the way, when I hear the word United, I think United Breaks Guitars. That's what I think about. It was a complete viral sensation, right? And they begged him, do not make the second video. And he said, listen, I begged you for a year. You didn't listen to me? I'm making it, and he made it, and it was just as viral. It went completely nuts, it went bonkers, and United paid the price. And that's the reality, for good and for bad, of the internet. So if you guys have startups, everyone here has a startup. Did he get a free, oh, they, of course, yeah, they compensated him, and then some. Um, the reality is, and let's, let's drill down in a, minute, in a bit, but the reality is, guys, whatever it is, who here is B2C? Raise your hand. The other or two different companies? Two, and the rest of you guys are B2B? Okay, so the, the goal is, and I think that this is, in my humble opinion, a, a misconception. I think people think, you know, social is only relevant for B2C, and, you know, if you're Instagram, you can do Twitter. If you're B2B, you can't. It's just not true. I mean, correct to say that some high, high-level executives aren't on Twitter and aren't, but I mean, most are, and building relationships at the end of the day, is, it's just another means of building relationships. That, that is the bottom line with all these platforms. Think of it as a communication platform, a way to connect with people. It's, it's, a, it's a separate culture, it's a different culture, but the rule is what you would do offline, do online, and what you wouldn't do offline, don't do online, right? You wouldn't expect to walk into an Apple store and be attacked by someone saying, buy our product, we're the greatest. Same thing on Twitter. Don't jump in my face, get out of my face, be subtle. 
And that's an important word. How do you say subtle in Hebrew? You can't. There's no such word. Luludan is probably the closest. I figured that one in English. No. Well, you can't, but that, that's, but that's stupid. There's a reason you can't say subtle in Hebrew. I'm, I don't mean this in, I'm Israeli, by the way. I don't mean, I'm not like offending anyone. But subtlety, the word subtlety, do you guys know what it means? You know what it means? Udan is probably the closest word. It's to say something without saying it. It's not exactly Israeli culture to be subtle. We can all agree on that, right? In my opinion, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, you know, I'll give it to you guys. What do you think is the fundamental difference, not the tactical difference, the fundamental difference between sales and marketing? Because both sales and marketing are saying, here's an awesome pair of sunglasses, buy them, right? If marketing isn't converting at the end, then what are you doing? So what's the, what's the real difference? I'm asking, I'm, I'm genuinely curious to know your opinion. What's the difference between sales and marketing? Marketing tries to seduct. Yeah. Marketing tries try to seduct uh, the person to buy something, to do something, and sales try to close it. Close it. Yeah. Sales is. Um, Speak up so they can hear you. Sales is buying a uh, pair of Nike shoes. Marketing is a Nike brand. Okay. So you say it, and then they brand it, and you see famous people wearing their shoes, etc. So it's a branding type of thing. So I think branding is part of marketing, though. I mean, let's say affiliate marketing isn't branding. I mean, marketing is a very broad, broad term, in my opinion. I don't. I hear what you're saying. I'm not disagreeing with you in any by any means, but I think it's, I think it's, it's deeper than that, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I think me, I'm, I did both uh, so far. So for me, uh, marketing is more uh, bring the person's attention. Uh, to you, whereas uh, sales is giving the courage to actually okay. walk with them home. All right, so I think I think there's I think there's two fundamental differences. Well, I, no, the truth is I think there's one fundamental difference. Then I'll explain. You guys play basketball? Yes. Play basketball? All right. So I'll, I'll get back to it in a second. But the, the main difference I think is subtlety. Sales is here's a great pair of sunglasses. Buy it. Marketing is, you know, here's a great blog post about marketing about about sunglasses. Here's a you know here's a, a resource about sunglasses. By the way, I also sell sunglasses. The subtlety. In both cases, you want the person to buy. In one case, you're picking up the phone and saying, buy my product. And in another case, here, take something. And by the way, if you want to buy, buy. I'm obviously at a very high level, but why did I ask about basketball? You guys know what an alley-oop is? Anybody not know what an alley-oop? For those who don't know, an alley-oop is, right? So two, two players are coming down the court. One can take the ball and he can dunk it, or he can do an alley-oop. He can pass it to his teammate. The other guy can catch it and dunk it. That's sales and marketing, right? Marketing, branding, and other things is elevating your brand, elevating, 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 comes along with sales, and when I say sales, it could be sales, and it could be user acquisition on Facebook and ad, but it's something that's meant to convert to close, comes along with sales and dunks it. Now, you can dunk it without marketing, but you can't compare the ease, the ease of coming across an ad on Facebook that I've never heard of, of a brand that I've never heard of, to coming across an ad on Facebook to, for a brand that I've been reading their blog for seven months, right? In one case, I might download it. We know the numbers, by the way. The numbers are super low. Here's an interesting statistic for you, by the way. You know, right, click-through rate, everyone's familiar, it's very, very low in general, but you know, once you click through, forget the click-through rate, once I click through on an ad on Facebook and I'm on the landing page on the App Store, remember, I clicked on an ad for an app, and now I'm on the page of that app on the App Store. What percentage of people, once they get there, do you think actually download the app? 5%. 5? 1%. Maybe less. One percent. It's unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. Now, how do you increase that number? And and the better question is afterwards, because at the end of the day, and I'm going all over the place. So again, if I'm if I'm running too fast, at the end of the day, a few years ago, the big question in mobile, and I think generally speaking in digital, was how do you get discovered? How do you get your app, your service? How do you get traction? In mobile, at least, that's. I'm not gonna say it's cracked, but there's ways to get traction, right? You can buy users. I don't mean that in a dirty way. Use Facebook, use TapDraw, use, get users. The question today is, how do you retain those users? Right, because we all know, we all have ADD. You download an app, in 10 seconds, if I don't like it, it's gone forever. How do you increase that retention? How do you keep people interested? There's two ways. And again, very, very basic. I'm not, you know, you can, obviously there's a whole world of this, you know, user retention, but two basic ways. First of all, product. The product's not good, just forget about it. And if the product's unbelievable, you know, that's, ob that's the obvious. But the, the second thing is brand, right? If I've been reading your blog every day, or I've been following you on Twitter, you know Pebble, you know Pebble, the smartwatches? These guys, are, they're brilliant. You ask them something on Twitter, they respond with, a, with, a, with an animated GIF. All the responses are animated GIFs. That's their shtick, that's their thing. But what does it make you feel, right? It makes you feel, oh, these guys are so cute. It makes you feel, that's the important thing. It makes you feel, right? Again, traditional marketing, that's not even on the table. It's emotion, sentiment, it's, right? So the point is, by, by, by 
providing, but giving businesses a face, because at the end of the day, people don't do business with businesses. People do business with people. And I don't care if you're IBM, or if you're Pebble, or if you're Apple. There's a reason, even Tim Cook, right? Apple, the big Apple that's not even on Twitter, but Tim Cook is. He's the face now, right? The important thing is that your company, whatever it is, isn't just another company there building a product, that's great. But you're gonna hit a ceiling eventually, unless you have some sort of a face, unless you're interacting with your users, listening to your users, and providing a way to engage with you and for you to engage with them. Social is that, that way. And content is that way. Because the only way to establish your name as somebody that's worth listening to is by providing value, providing content. Now again, that doesn't mean you need to come in every day and write 5,000 word articles, because not everyone's capable of doing that. But it does sure as hell mean that something of value has to come out of your company. Because if you're sitting there like this all day long writing, I mean code, that's it, you're, you might build a great product. And, and I don't mean, um, there are many, you know, I'm not gonna say the cynical people, but cynical people out there who are gonna be like, ah, forget that marketing bullshit, you know? Sorry, pardon my French. Just build great products. Great products are at the foundation of everything. You can do great marketing from now till tomorrow, and if you don't have a good product, then you're gonna be in trouble. But the same is true for the opposite. If you have a great product, and there's no way that anybody can hear about it, and there's no way for anybody to feel anything towards you, and you're not a face, you're just a tie, uh, you know, corporate office, it's not 1995. In 2015, it just doesn't work. And there's a reason, by the way, if you open Red Bull on your, redbull.com on your, on your phone right now, you'll notice something very interesting. The word beverage or drink does not even appear on the website once. You literally would not even know that they sell drinks. What are they selling? What do you think of what you think Red Bull? Energy. Flying at, right, energy, flying, jump, jumping out of planes, content. They're a content company. Of course it converts to sales, right? Does that continue? No, it has that. Wait, keep streaming. Oh, hate when that happens. Meerkat has to like not let people call you when you're on. Apologize for that. Uh, so, you know, they're one example, but take another example, right? What is the most unsexy thing at least I could think of is web hosting, right? Web hosting isn't exactly exciting to anyone, no matter how geeky you are, right? Rackspace, right? They're one of the bigger, they hired, they hired this guy named Robert Scoble. I don't know if you guys have heard of this guy, right? His, he has a funny title, whatever the point is, the guy drives, travels around the world, meeting startups every day, making a ridiculous amount of noise on the internet, writing, and he's a big influencer, and he, he almost never talks about Rackspace, almost never, but he works for them. Now, I happen to know that the amount of sales that he drives to Rackspace is unprecedented. But a person who looks at like the short, small picture says, wait a second, this guy Robert Scoble is taking pictures of Google Glass in the shower, doing all kinds of goofy things. What does Rackspace gain from that? It's hard to see when you don't see the ROI, when you're trying to quantify it in like, you know, then you're missing the big picture. And even the biggest companies, forget Red Bull, Rackspace, right? Guy Kawasaki, by the way, did it for Apple years ago. He was a product evangelist. What does that mean? Apple wasn't always cool. Apple used to be like a nerdy company, right? And he said his job was go evangelize us. Don't necessarily sell, but be our face. Because everyone needs a face. You can't just be a brand. You can't just, in 2015, you can't just have a company and a product. You need a face. Let's, let's give me some questions, guys, and then we'll move on. Lot, we'll drill down to, to platforms in a second. What platforms, but yeah. You were talking about uh, speak up, Twitter speak up. a lot. Hold on one second, let me just talk. I'm gonna turn it. Yeah. Yes. No. We're talking about Twitter a lot, and Twitter is not big in Israel, like at all. It's not big at all. I don't have a Twitter account, and I don't have any friends. No one's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> How do you? Uh, what are uh, other kinds of platforms you can use, like Twitter, for this kind of marketing? Okay. Because awesome. Facebook is not doing the same job as Twitter. Awesome question. Anything else? I'm gonna talk about that. So first of all, um, if I heard, if I had a dime for every person that said to me Twitter is not big in Israel, I'd be, uh, I'd be investing myself. I can, I, I'm happy, literally, after we finish, I'll open Twitter. I will show you right now. I'm not gonna do any preparation. I didn't know you were gonna ask that question. I will open Twitter right now, and I will show you, in the last 30 tweets, how many of them are Israeli. I guarantee you, and I'm telling you right now, I'll show it to you, at least 50% of them are Israeli. Now, yes, America's sleeping right now, that's true, but any time of the day, it's, it's just not true. Is it as mainstream as Facebook? No, but it's not as mainstream as Facebook in other countries either. To say Twitter didn't take off in Israel, I'm not, I, it's not, it's just, it's not true. I know that it's, it's, it's this misconception. I, I, I'm telling you again, I, you know, Bezik Ben Lumi is there, Orange is there, the, the companies are there and they're engaging by the way. I can send Orange right now a DM on Twitter and they'll respond like that, two seconds. They're all there. All the VCs in Israel, every single one of the investors are on, are on Twitter, active, right? The big tech blogs are getting all their traffic from Twitter. So 
Is it as mainstream as Facebook? Absolutely not. But that is an advantage, not a disadvantage. Now is the time for you to get there because you can still differentiate because you're not swallowed up by all the noise. So first of all, absolutely get on Twitter, like yesterday. That's number one. And just, if you want, I'm happy to talk to you about it, but if you Google everything you need to know about Twitter and tweeting, I wrote a user guide about Twitter that answers any question you have, literally. So that's, it'll take you a few weeks to read because it's like 50,000 articles together. But but that's, that's I mean, Twitter is, you must be on Twitter, honestly. As, as, a, as an entrepreneur, I mean, again, Twitter, has, the things have happened to me on Twitter that's just unbelievable. That's number one. Facebook um, is very interesting. Facebook, I'm, and this is my opinion, by the way. I'm sure other marketers will say otherwise. Some people have had big success. Facebook is the best there is at a, as an advertising platform. So if you're driving downloads to your app, Facebook remains the best, okay? Put that aside, though. Forget advertising for one second. Facebook as a marketing platform is fundamentally broken. It's broken. Why is it broken? How many times, raise your hand, have you gotten a message, please like my page on Facebook? Someone saying to you, please like my page, right? You guys have all gotten that, right? Everyone. Why, why does that happen? Why, why do people say to you, please like my page? You know why? Because nobody likes their page. Because there's no way to get, if, so, if someone likes my page, then they'll see my content. And if they don't, they won't. You know, I've seen people ask on their Facebook page, please like my page. Do you understand who you're talking to? The people that already like your page. It's called preaching to the choir, right? Very, very limited resources on getting Facebook content out. On Twitter, there's a general timeline. Anybody can see anything. It can go viral. Facebook, without spamming your friends, and this happens to me every day, probably 50 times a day, people say, please like my page. And I, I actually wrote an article called, For the Love of God, this is the title, I swear. For the love of God, stop asking me to like your irrelevant Facebook page. Because you know why? I'll tell you why, and I'll get to you in a second. Forget for one second the spammy nature, how annoying it is. Forget that. Okay, let's say we're best friends, and I want to help you, and you know that, and so you ask me to like your page. Great. If, you're, if you have a business for ballet, and I like your page because you understand that when I, once I click like, all my you know, friends and followers will see that I liked it, you think anybody's going to say, oh, hey, I like that ballet page. He must really like that business. What are they going to realize? That some guy asked me to like his ballet page. It's not authentic. It gets nothing. So forget the fact that you're spamming me and annoying me. It's ineffective. It's completely ineffective. No one thinks it's authentic. And if it's not relevant to my kind of message or what I'm focused on, then people are going to know that you did it as a favor to someone. So it's just, it's worthless. So Facebook, on a, on a personal level, you know, to brand your, yourself through, your company through yourself, through content that you're, in other words, if you follow me on Facebook or, or we're connected on Facebook, you'll see that I share a lot of content that drives traffic to, to Zula where I work. That's, that works as a person. But Facebook pages are fundamentally flawed, at least in my experience. There are some companies out there that have big success, but for every one company that, in my opinion, that's had big success on a Facebook page, there are thousands that have complete failures. And I'll tell you something else. Many companies buy likes, right? It's pretty much the dumbest thing you can do. Let me tell you why. Why are you buying likes? What are you, what are you hoping to accomplish? You're hoping to say to your investor, look, we have 300,000 likes. If your investor even has the slightest bit of intelligence in his head, what is he gonna do, or she? He's gonna go look at the posts and see that there's one comment on each post. So you have 300,000 likes and one comment, so what did you just do? You in essence said my, my click-through rate, or my actual engagement, is much lower. Because if I have five likes and I have four comments, wow, four out of five people actually engage? But if I have 300,000 likes, they're all fake, and I have two comments on each? What you're saying basically is that I have the worst content in the world and people do not engage with my brand at all. So you're shooting yourself in the foot. And I, too many smart companies are buying likes and buying, it's the stupidest thing you can do. So Facebook is, kind of the default so you need to be there because people are going to search for you on Facebook and if you don't have a page that's in it, if you have a page that's inactive it doesn't look good but if I were going to say you know between Facebook and Twitter the amount of resources you need to invest I would say face Twitter should get five times more than Facebook honestly as a business uh, I'll tell you something that if you guys promise not to throw a tomato at me I didn't bring a tomato, so. Google Plus relax breathe okay everyone chill out listen so I'll tell you I'll tell you what I think about Google Plus and I'm a very uh, controversial opinion on this and you know I'm sure people are gonna comment I'm gonna see all the tweets afterwards people will be like what the hell are you smoking uh, let me tell you about Google Plus okay let me just preface by saying what I'm saying applies right now will Google shut down Google Plus maybe they shut down Google Buzz Google Wave they, they've had a history of shutting down social products so that might happen but let's not talk about what's gonna happen and speculate let's talk about right now I've been on Twitter for seven years I have like 20 29 something thousand followers I've been on Google Plus for three years I have 55,000 followers Okay, so a third of the time, double the amount of followers. Okay, I get, you know, besides that tweet during the war that I said got 1,200 followers, I get one, two, five, fifteen, 15, and if it's an amazing tweet, 100 retweets on a tweet, 
There are posts on Google Plus. I posted something, and then, by the way, be, to be very clear here, I'm not talking about tech only. So I'm, you know, people, everyone says, oh, it's only geeks. Forget that. I once posted a picture. True story. And I can, I'm happy to send you the links. I posted a picture on Twitter of LeBron James meeting Michael Jordan for the first time when he was in high school. Okay, totally not tech related. I put it on Twitter, and I put it on Google Plus. On Twitter, I got 30 something retweets. On Google Plus, I got 1,500 shares. 1,500. Now, anybody who says it's a ghost town, I mean, numbers don't lie. Those are numbers. Those are real numbers. Those aren't opinions. Those are numbers. So how do I explain it, right? Because your friends aren't on Google Plus. That's what you're all thinking, right? My friends, my mom's not there. Your mom's not supposed to be there. Google, by definition, from day one, this is not a Facebook competitor. We are not a standalone social network. What we are is a layer that unifies all of Google's portfolio. So Google, we all use Google Search, right? We all use Google Maps. We all use Google Android. We all use, you know, tasks. We, Gmail, right? We all use these things, and they're free, mostly, unless you pay for a premium. Google says, listen, use them, by all means, but use our social layer that unifies it all. So that means, and here's, here's where it gets tricky, guys. Here's why, in my opinion, any business, you know, any entrepreneur, anybody that's involved in, in, in the digital world, not being on Google Plus is, I don't know how to say this nicely, it's complete stupidity, and I'll tell you why. I don't know if you know this. But Google's putting all their eggs in one basket. They're saying, if you want to review an Android app on Google Play, you need a Google Plus lo lo login. If you want to comment on YouTube, you need a Google Plus login. And if you want traffic from search, you can do SEO, which we talked about before, or you can be on Google Plus, because Google Plus content appears on top. So what you're saying is, okay, I get it, Google. You want me to be on Google Plus, but I'm gonna fight you on it. Not a very intelligent move, right? I don't think anybody here wants to fight. I'm not saying to put all your eggs and get on Google Plus and don't do anything else. But to ignore Google Plus as a business, and by the way, just again, forget everything else. The engagement there, the numbers there. If you build a community there around whatever it is, Barbie dolls, community of Barbie doll owners, you're gonna see the traffic there is through the roof. So there's the traffic, there's the things that Google, the perks, quote unquote, or the threats, I would say, depends how you look at it. Google says, if you don't use Google Plus, then you won't get this, or if you do Google Plus, you'll get this. Depends how you look at it. There's another perk, and that's, there's not one, literally, not one top level Google executive that's not there and listening several, several times, probably close to 50 times over the years, I posted something, a complaint or a feature request that Vic Kundacha was, was then a senior VP of engineering at Google, ran Google Plus, he left, but now Bradley Horowitz runs it. Bradley Horowitz and I, I mean, he's a top dog in Google. We're like, I, you know, I text him, I, I you know, message him, ask him for this feature, that feature. He's like, oh, thank you so much. I, I wrote him the other day, I don't know if you guys surely read on the, on the news how Google Plus separated photos, they took it out and everyone's like, oh, Google Plus is dead. So I wrote him in a, you know, G-chat I said, Bradley, you know I evangelize Google Plus, you know I love it, should I stop? Are you guys killing Google Plus? And he said, absolutely not. We took out that product because we saw that the way users use it is different. Just like Facebook took out Messenger. It is a no indication that Google Plus is dying. Will it die? Maybe, I'm not saying it won't, right? Google Plus, Google has killed certain products. But right now, as it stands, my numbers are through the roof. So to ignore Google Plus is silly. You asked about other platforms, Twitter is great, Facebook is necessary, Google Plus, if you invest, here's the thing though, right? All those people who say it's a ghost town, they're not lying, that's the experience that they're getting. They're getting a ghost town, why? Because they're going in there, they're writing one article or one post, they're not engaging with anyone else, and they're expecting engagement. So you're going to an empty room and you're yelling. Of course no one's gonna engage with you. Go in there, invest time, provide content, valuable content, engage with other people, and that's true about any platform, by the way. Same thing, by the way, I remember from day one with Twitter, everyone's like, ah, there's nobody there, it's just for geeks. Now look at Twitter, right? Again, you think it didn't take off in Israel? Leave that aside. In the world, it's very influential. Same thing as Google Plus. It might change, but as of now, to not be there is just silly. Now, th then there's the next level, right? Um, I'm a huge fan of Instagram. Now, Instagram is really good for one thing because I don't know if you guys know. You guys, are you Instagram users? No. So on Instagram, you can't share a link. There's no way to like click a URL, not in the comments, not in anything. So it's not really a marketing platform per se. You can't drive traffic. What you could do though is establish a culture of your company. So where I work, you know, we're a Zula is a messenger, you know, messaging uh, platform for Teams, right? So we could be that, or we could be something much greater. Our, our CEO uh, lives in, in uh, Arizona, and he came to Israel a few weeks ago, and he had a barbecue with his friends. He was telling us that his friend said to him, "So tell me about this Zula company." And he's like, "Oh, yeah, we're a small little startup, you know, or a few people." He's like, "What do you mean? You're not a, you're not a public company?" He's like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "You guys are everywhere. I, th I think of you. I think of this like empire." That, that's what's called perception is reality. You build a brand out there. People, you know, follow you on Instagram. They see you at company lunches. They see you at company trips. They see you, you're working, you know, brainstorming. They see your, 
They think of you as this cool company. That is very valuable. Is it gonna drive traffic to your app? Not necessarily. In the long run, yes. But it's very, very valuable to spread the, 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 the culture of your company. Um, other, other platforms that are very, very um, effective, but really depends what you do. What do you do? What's your company? Uh, B2B. Give me like one sentence. What's... Uh, we'll try to optimize. Like, uh, optimize what? Delivery. Deli delivery. Physical delivery? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like DHL delivery? Like delivery. Got it. Everything. So I mean, to me it would seem, I know, I, know I, think, I think it's, again, Pinterest is, you can drive traffic, but it's, it's, I would say it drives traffic more to like physical product shopping. I guess there's, there is a hook there a little bit. There is some sort of a connection. You'd have to be a little bit creative in how to use Pinterest, but it's potentially a, an explosive platform in terms of traffic. Um, Pinterest, how do you call it? Pinterest, P-I-N-T-E-R-E-S-T. -E -E I'll give you an example of the way I use Pinterest. Because generally speaking, it's very like design focused, and uh, I'm not, I don't want to sound sexist, but a lot of females use it. Can I say that? No, okay, sorry. Um, so I use it for something else. Just totally coincidental. I, I meet startups a lot, right? And when I meet a startup, I take a selfie with, with them. Anybody who follows me on Twitter or Facebook sees I take a lot of selfies with people. And people are like, oh, well, I do. Every time I take a, a picture with an innovator, somebody in the space, and in tech, I put it on my Pinterest board. The Pinterest board is called Innovators That Inspire, or Innovators Who Inspire. And for years I've been doing this, right? Journalists, you know, VCs, angels, um, startup founders, startup teams, just hundreds and hundreds of pictures of people in tech. And I did it just for fun. Oh, cool, I have a way to document everyone I meet. Over the years, I've gotten easily 100 VCs or startups saying to me, oh, you met with that startup, oh, you met with that VC, introduce me. And actual funds, like rounds of financing have been closed through my Pinterest board. P people actually reached out to me, I, I mean, last, Two weeks ago, I met with a woman, I'm, gonna leave, I'm not going to mention her name, who worked at Apple for eight years. And I met with her, and we, you know, we had coffee, and we were talking, and she said, I'm, I just made Aliyah, I just moved to Israel, I want to get a job. I was like, listen, you worked at Apple for eight years, I really don't think you're going to have a very hard time getting a job. She's like, well, I don't know anyone here. I was like, okay, we took our selfie, put it on. She got offers from, I mean, you name it, literally. And I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened had we not done that. But, you know, the other day, I met with someone, um, yesterday, yesterday I met with someone, and I put that selfie, I got easily 10 messages within five minutes saying, please introduce me, she's looking for biz dev, I'm looking for biz dev. Now, she's, I'm, I guarantee you she will land a job. By the way, over the last three years, through what I'm talking about right now, I've gotten 92 people jobs in tech. Signed, 92 people. It's all through networking. I don't, I'm not a headhunter, I don't take money from it, I'm happy to help, but the point is, it's all done through networking and through providing value. Again, it's another form of value. It's another way for people to feel something and communicate and engage with you. Questions? guys are right after you guys wake up yes um earlier you were talking about the yeah, let me, let me. oh sorry i'll I can stick up no it's all right you're a good looking guy it's fine yeah uh, earlier you were talking about uh, how by buying uh, likes or buying those kind of uh, things is uh, stupid um, now, for a lot of the reasons you mentioned i completely agree with you on that that you can get yourself in an embarrassing situation that uh, and you can get in front of an investor where you're not the real deal actually However, as an end user, when I think to myself, when I browse on YouTube, when a guy sends me a link or a name, when I look at YouTube and I see uh, 790 views and then I see 120,000 views, I don't think twice I know which one to click, you know? 100%. And that's what makes me click. Even if I'm just on YouTube browsing, trying to find something, doesn't, the picture doesn't barely matter. I look if there is like 50 clicks, there's no way in hell I am clicking it. So. How is this? Because this the trends. People don't like to be brave. People have to do things by themselves. They'll purpose, not purposely, but they'll choose the wrong answer because ninety percent of other people did the same wrong answer. So they still feel more comfortable going with that, even if themselves they feel otherwise or they know the correct answer. So isn't this like stopping some sort of flow or a good way to create a flow in the beginning? It's a, it's a good question. I'll get to you in a second. Remember your question. So basically, um, just sum up your question. Oh, I almost knocked your water off. That was close. <laughs> My water? Okay. Yeah. Then I could drink it even though my finger was in it. <laughs> so the question was basically, by not buying likes or, or engagement or clicks or whatever it is, if I come to your video and there's no likes on it, then I'm not going to click. Whereas if I had 700 that I bought, then I would click. So why not buy? It's a great question, a legitimate question. From that perspective, maybe you're right. But the answer is, when I asked before about the difference in sales and marketing, I said, not a tactical difference. Because the tactical differences between sales and marketing, one is short term, one is long term. 
anything you're gonna do in marketing that you want to be sustainable, right? If you're going after someone to click and you think that 700 likes will impress them, by all means, go buy those 700 clicks. But realize that those 700 people that liked your page will be of no value and no engagement the day after that. So if you want something sustainable, you need to build it up gradually, like everything, right? If you go like this, I don't know if you can see me, if you go like that, you're gonna go like that. If you go like this, it will sustain, it will remain. So if your goal is, your sole goal is to get that person to click and you know 700 likes will impress them, then go buy it. But if you wanna build a brand and you wanna build something that people are gonna engage with long term, and that people are gonna think, when they think of optimization of delivery, they think of you, that that's not done by buying likes. So think long term, because if you think short term, then you're gonna have a problem. And by the way, if you look at companies out there in the social space, uh, you know, I'll, I'll name some because I don't think anybody debates this. You know, a company like Viddy or Social Cam, you guys have for sure seen it on Facebook, maybe a year ago. It was like a huge hockey stick, it was like exploding, and all the VCs threw money at them, and then it just, boom, why? Because it was completely dependent on, social, on Facebook, and Facebook didn't like it very much. They tweaked something in their algorithm and boom, all their traffic went garbage. And by the way, BuzzFeed, right? BuzzFeed, all their, you know, link bait, that's, that's why they're, they're shifting right now. They're, they're pivoting. They're making it more of a real journalistic site because they realize that you won't believe what happened next can only sustain itself for a certain while and then people are going to get fed up with it and Facebook will get fed up with it. So just generally speaking, and Meerkat, by the way, is this is a big debate. Is it smart that Meerkat's so dependent on Twitter? It's a debate worth having. And one of the biggest, uh, one, of, one of my biggest role models, at, um, Mark Suster is a big uh, VC. He, he, he's talking about this topic. Is it good to build something on another platform? I think the best model is to build something on another platform so that you get the traction and then pivot over to your own, your own you know, network. But at the end of the day, you, know, you, need, to, you need to think long term. And these social, social camera video were thinking short term. They hijacked or they, um, they caught a ride kind of thing. Uh, it's called a trimp. What's the word I'm looking for? Not, how do you say trimp in English? All right. No, there's a word. Like red? Yeah, whatever. Anyway, they, they caught a ride, right, on, on, on Facebook social graph, and then, they, and then they crashed. So if you think short term, you'll crash. If you think long term, you'll build something much, much bigger. Yeah. Wait, hold on. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, I will be trying to be more accurate about my last, uh, my first question. Uh, if we're thinking just, just in small, uh, small size, like if I want to approach businesses in Ashdod only, okay. only in Ashdod, that's yes. my mission. There is one, just Ashdod, one Ashdod in the whole world. Right. And I know about myself that I use Facebook and YouTube only, and I assume that the, the vast majority of businesses use, it, use only, I mean, ice cream shops, restaurants, use Facebook and the right. no, Nobody in Ashdod is, is using Twitter. Right. That, that, yeah, no, I agree, I agree, it's I agree. my assumption. Yeah, no, yeah. I agree with you. Okay. Yeah, I, I might so do you, wrong. Is it worth using, as you're saying? No, no, it's not about this. How, to, how do I approach them on social network? Just by Facebook? Uh, and how if just how do I do it in Facebook? So you're saying if you want to approach a falafel stand in Ashdod, I'm, I'm exaggerating, right? Exactly. You want to approach a falafel stand, how are you going to approach them on Facebook? Yeah. Or on no. social? Yeah. Yeah, you won't. <laughs> I won't. No, you won't. I'll tell you. Um, years ago, uh, it was a long story, but a, a year, years ago, a friend of mine I went to school with, like in high school, 